This is Carolina Business Review. Major support provided by Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their families, their finances, and their futures. High Point University, the premier life skills university focused on preparing students for the world as it is going to be. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. When the issues with Silicon Valley Bank emerged a couple of weeks ago, it instilled depositor and investor fear in banks for sure. But maybe the broader, primal response was more like PTSD from 2008 to 2009. I'm Chris William, and welcome again to the most widely watched and longest running program on Carolina business, policy, and public affairs seen every week across North and South Carolina. We are going to unpack banking and financial services. It's pretty important in the Carolinas, and we have insiders to wade in on it with us. And we start right now. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, James Sills from M&F Bank, Peter Gwaltney of the North Carolina Bankers Association, Fred L. Green III from the South Carolina Bankers Association, and Dr. Robert Hartwig of the Risk and Uncertainty Management Center, University of South Carolina. And welcome back to our program, gentlemen. Bob, welcome for the first time. Uh, hope you have a good experience, but let's let's get into it. Um, Jim Sills, you are a sitting CEO at a bank. Jim, would you describe what happened with not just SVB, but just everything since then as a banking crisis? Chris, um, I don't consider this a banking crisis. Yes, there were a lot of uh, headlines and a lot of uh, media attention on the financial services industry, but it was really contained to two or three or a handful of banks. Um, and then it spread a little bit to some of the regional banks that were you know, fairly, fairly large. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, uh, the banking market is uh, safe and sound. Uh, community banks are strong, medium-sized banks are very strong. So I, I think it's not, a, it's not, in my view, it's not a banking crisis. We did receive a lot of inquiries the first couple of days, but it, since then, everything has been very stable for most institutions all across North Carolina. Yeah, Dr. Hardwick, you've, you've got, you're an expert in risk assessment, management maybe, uh, certainly at, at USC and beyond, but I mean, how do you, how do you uh, unpack this idea of what happened? Is this a banking crisis or is this well, bank, some banks in crisis? I, well, I, I agree with Jim here, but um, I kind of see this as a failure of risk management. I mean, if you look at uh, how SVB was manag managing its assets versus its liabilities, um, this was an accident waiting to happen. And uh, the rapidly rising interest rates we've seen over the past year uh, were sort of the catalyst that uh, ignited this. But even then, I mean, uh, SVB really should have uh, seen the problems that were emerging uh, on its balance sheet, should have uh, uh, essentially purchased very basic sort of derivative structures and instruments in order to manage this. Uh, most other banks in the United States did successfully manage this. I work in the insurance world primarily, and insurers uh, seem to manage this as well. Uh, so again, I, I agree with Jim that this was a problem with several banks. Uh, and that I believe it was isolated more or less to those banks uh, and, and, and that the contagion effect was relatively limited here, in part because of the actions of, uh, of the federal government. I think that those were important. That's probably something that we'll get into. Uh, but the good news here is, and what I've been saying, is that this is not a repeat of the financial crisis in 2008. Right. This was not a Lehman moment. This was not a Bear Stearns moment. Uh, and, and fortunately, and I think the markets have been bought into the narrative already, uh, that this was an isolated issue. 
Peter, Fred, so uh, is this a crisis in confidence? Maybe the way that banks uh, are, uh, the way that banks are set up about lending out money, about taking deposits, et cetera, et cetera. Either one of you. Peter, Peter let me jump in first because yeah. uh, these three banks, and if you go back to Silvergate, which was a smaller one that started it all, they had very, very unique business models, unlike every other bank in the country. So what they had was a very small number of very large depositors. Every other bank in the country is based on small depositors, small, uh, a, a, a large group of small customers. And so they have diversity where these banks had virtually no diversity. The, the other thing that was unique about uh, SVB is it happened pretty much overnight through the, uh, I guess, technology, through the ability to to move money on a keystroke on your phone is exacerbated by social media uh, post, you know, take your money out. And, and basically they were gone in less than 24 hours. Yeah, Fred, uh, great explanation. And Chris, great question. Confidence is everything in banking. Banking is built on confidence that a, a business or a consumer can put their money in the bank and they'll be able to get it back. And what the regulatory agencies did, and you re referenced this earlier, the actions of the regulatory agencies on that Sunday evening to guarantee all deposits of the two banks that failed, SVB and Signature, mm -hmm. calmed the markets. It, it steadied things. So when banks opened that Monday morning, customers were nervous, but there wasn't a widespread crisis. There wasn't a widespread run. And, and that, was, that was critical that they did that. So for anyone on this panel, is there an appropriate, is there a proportional response by the Fed and the regulators to this? And by proportional response, what, what do you mean? Well, uh, so Senate hearings, of course, and we always oh. see that when, there's a, when there is a perceived crisis, uh, Congress gets involved. But, but th th maybe we'll, we'll start with the dialogue around insurance. Is the FDIC enough insurance, at least on the general bank side for depositors? Does there need to be uh, more oversight? I, l let me say this, and not to exacerbate and make this question even longer, but some, an insider said to me last week, what we, we don't need more regulation. We need to enforce what's already on the books. Um, so again, how, has there been a, is there a good response from regulators? Will this have a good outcome? Hey, Chris, let me try to uh, attack that problem, that question. Um, I, I think the regulators need to examine SVB very closely to prevent that type of uh, risky business model and the after effects of it happening again mm -hmm. versus, you know, just widespread new regulation that impacts all banks. Most banks are extremely uh, strong, have strong capital positions. So, I think it's important to just to, to examine SVB and the other failures just to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with Jim. The, the regulatory agencies had plenty of authority to supervise SVB and Signature Bank. Uh, and so there are a lot of questions about how management failed at the bank to manage risk, how regulatory oversight missed things, and we had a flash failure of two banks that we weren't talking about the week before. And so there will be a lot of questions, and we're very fortunate uh, in North Carolina, we have Patrick McHenry chairing the House Financial Services Committee. Senator Tillis is on the uh, Senate Banking Committee, and Tim Scott, Senator Scott from uh, South Carolina is the ranking member of the Senate Banking Committee. They're asking a lot of questions of the regulatory agencies. How did this happen? Um, what did the the regulatory agencies miss? How did how did the bank mismanage risk so terribly? And how can we avoid this again? What changes need to be made, or what changes don't need to be made? These are all very important questions, and the right people are asking all the right questions. Uh, Fred, we're, I want to get to you in a second, Fred, on, on smaller banks in, in South Carolina, particularly. But before we do that, Bob, I want to go to you on this idea that. Uh, there's a lot of talk that supervision on the Fed side missed, and it was a big miss, et cetera, et cetera, and they're unwinding that. But is there something else that's part of this dialogue? Again, the question, do we need to enforce what's on the books, or does there need to be a, another idea about what additional regulatory oversight needs to be considered? Right. So kind of lost in the whole SVB debate, and there was a lot of finger pointing in the immediate aftermath of this. 
Was it the failure of management and SVB? Was it the lack of appropriate and sufficient oversight on the part of regulators? Which regulators? Was it the Federal Reserve? Was it the FDIC? Uh, was it Congress? Whose fault was it? Who was asleep at the switch there potentially? Um, uh, and then even beyond that, we heard a lot of recriminations uh, going beyond. Not only was SVB potentially asleep at the switch, but they were so enamored with being woke, for instance, is one narrative that you hear uh, that they weren't paying attention to the fundamentals of what it takes to actually run a bank. Um, and this was in part driven by the fact that they were, you know, in Sil Silicon Valley where people are uh, enamored with this kind of a thing and they were blinded by it. Mm -hmm. um, but to get back to your question, uh, I, and, I, and I'm going to agree with uh, and Fred and others here that uh, we need to examine what happened at Silicon Valley specifically. You know, quite frankly, if you look at what happened at Silicon Valley uh, Bank is you had a, a, a 21st century version of what happened it's in a wonderful life. If you were to bring Jimmy Stewart back here today for that movie, he would recognize, and the character he played would recognize exactly what happened, except now that we have Twitter and means of moving cash around very quickly in a digital sense. It was a classic run on a bank. Why in the year 2023, uh, given everything we know from the experience, not just from the financial crisis of 2008, but going all the way back to the Great Depression, um, we've done a lot to try to prevent those kinds of things. And the FDIC was one great innovation to help prevent those bank runs from occurring. So to me, that suggests that the general framework of regulation um, has um, actually functioned relatively well. If you look at, uh, it was actually 867 days from the date that Signature Valley uh, went down the drain. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, Signature Valley, sorry, uh, <laughs> conflating two different banks here. Uh, uh, Silicon Valley went down the drain to the, pro the, the most recent bank failure before that. That was the longest interval between bank failures since the 1930s, so basically 90 years ago. So something is largely going right in terms of preventing these kind of uh, classic bank runs. And, and so what that means is likely an idiosyncratic issue at Silicon Valley. Uh, what went wrong? We need to figure that out. And if there needs to be some tweaking of existing regulation, that's what should happen. So, uh, Fred, let me let me come to you. And, not, and notwithstanding, Bedford Falls would ha hold hearings on whether the Bailey Loan and Trust is going to be if they're going to bail them out or not. But that, that, you know, that does bring up the idea of smaller banks. Fred, what's the implication? for all of the, the dialogue now that it, are going on for Carolina banks, because we have a lot of small banks in North and South Carolina, the community banks. You know they're at the center of a lot of these communities. So what happens with them going forward? So probably just like Peter did and, and our colleagues from around the country, that Monday morning after the two banks failed, I uh, created a conference call. We had over 500 bankers throughout the state. Part of that was for us to uh, keep our fingers on the pulse, know what was happening within the banking industry in the South Carolina, talk about the uniqueness of the two bank failures, that we don't have a model that even approaches that, um, and, and to suggest uh, any media contact, pretty much promote that, which we did. And as a result, uh, we had zero negative media coverage on the South Carolina banking industry, meaning that there was no story there, or if there was a story, it was a positive story that the banks in South Carolina are healthy. They're not having runs on deposits. They're well capitalized and and pretty good earnings given the environment we're in. Uh, Peter, what 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 are you seeing? Same thing. Well, the same experience. And as I made calls around the state doing uh, house calls with all of our banks by phone, they were just telling me it was business as usual. An occasional phone call from a concerned customer, because if if the customers were sitting at home watching any of the new business news channels, they would get tied into a pretzel. It was it was very right. concerning, and it was being couched as a crisis. But really, in the banks, uh, there was a net inflow of deposits. Was the report that I was getting. And uh, if I could just add that, I mean, and what nobody expected to see in the immediate aftermath of Silicon Valley, that was in fact that it would be a North Carolina bank that would actually wind up acquiring uh, the Silicon, most of Silicon Valley's uh, operations. And so, 
I think that really says something for the state of the banking industry in the Carolinas that of anywhere in the country, uh, the bank that wound up assuming the operations of Silicon Valley was based in Raleigh, North Carolina. You know, good point, Bob. And, and, and Peter, I'm going to bring you back in on, on your observation around the first citizens acquisition of those assets from Silicon Valley Bank. Before we do that, though, Jim, I want to, you know, for... Same question for you. What are, what are the implications now forward for smaller banks? And there were many reports that the uh, that the funds moved from smaller mid-sized banks to large banks out of just an abundance of caution. Have you seen that? Yeah, we have not experienced that at MNF Bank. Uh, we did receive phone calls, but uh, we all of our deposits are really it's it's the same inflows and outflows that we've maintained for you know months. Uh, but the long-term implications are, is, is always going to be that big versus small. But we're relationship bankers. Our business model is a safe and sound model. We're well capitalized. And community banks specifically provide 60% of all the small business loans in the United States. So we're an important clog in the wheel, so to speak, for our financial services uh, industry. And I, I think uh, community banking is still going to be strong. I just don't want more regulation because we have so much of it now. Mm -hmm. Peter, what um, what's your observation about First Citizens' quick move to acquire the bank and, in fact, got the approval and the thumbs up from the Fed to do it? I, well, I was pleased to see that they were successful in their bid to acquire SVB uh, assets and, and loans and deposits and, and the bank in general. The, um, the bank has a long history of these FDIC assisted transactions through the banking first crisis citizens. first citizens yes through the banking crisis of 2008 they purchased a number of failed banks around the country and uh developed a practice around that and uh, they're very disciplined very conservative highly capitalized and they and they have a team who understand how to do this and so uh, I knew that if they were successful in their bid it would be because they they have a good relationship with the FDIC. The FDIC has confidence in their ability to execute on this. And uh, and it's good for the venture capital world and the startup world. They're not just all in California. We have them here in the Carolinas, specifically here in, in Charlotte and Raleigh and across North Carolina. And so and in Atlanta, it's important to have a thriving venture capital uh, marketplace and uh, startup marketplace. And so now... Uh, first citizens, as we see it, will be bringing a, a different kind of discipline, a uh, different kind of banking approach uh, to that sector. And that's important and are, to, to the health of our nation. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Are yeah. there other, for, for anyone here, are there other opportunities here or not just first citizens seeing the opportunity to strategically acquire the assets of what was Silicon Valley Bank, but are there other opportunities? Are we missing something because of some PTSD that we have? Anyone? I, I'm, I don't know of any specific opportunities, but maybe on an earlier comment, there were in in a number of our banks uh, deposits that came in from SVB. And, uh, uh, you know, it was unusual to find folks in Charleston, South Carolina that had a very large deposit account there. So I think that might be the opportunity. Let's do banking business with folks that you know mm -hmm. in the communities you're in. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, as an economist, I'll say this. If you look at the demographics of the Southeast and the Carolinas in particular, they are very, very favorable to the banking community in the sense that the demand for credit, uh, the inflow of deposits from around the country as people move to this part of the country, they form businesses, they grow businesses. If you look at uh, the corridor in, um, in, in South Carolina, up towards the Greenville, Spartanburg area, and down towards the Charleston area, with the enormous investments that are being made in infrastructure, and again, companies from the round, literally around the world investing in these areas, and I'm sure it's the same in North Carolina. I mean, I, I think it's a great place to be uh, in the banking community, and there's a lot of opportunities for organic growth uh, in addition to potentially some additional acquisitions along the lines of what we saw in First Citizens, not necessarily occurring sort of in an overnight type of in emergency context, but kind of organic uh, kinds of growth where there are economies of scale 
and scope that uh, regional banks in this region could realize. Uh, Jim, let me let me bring in again as the as sitting CEO of a bank, uh, a couple of things that came out of the uh, observations around SVB and some of the other banks that got in trouble the last couple of weeks, a few weeks, has been the idea of loans and lending and, and the assets that they held, obviously treasuries uh, that had gone down in their market value, but also loans. And as rates rise, the, the loan that you made that you booked now has a lower lower value. So uh, give us the, give us an idea that you see loans that you booked as of the end of last year have lost some value, um, but also the possibility as we maybe head into a recession, most likely some kind of slowdown, that there may be some more non-performing loans. What what do you keep in your eye on in, in that area? You know, we're, we're always looking at uh, asset quality. We have excellent asset quality at our institution, but as interest rates increase, it does make it more difficult for the borrower to uh, keep up with the payments if the, if the payments are variable, if they're increasing with the uh, increase in prime. And so we are looking at that very closely. We also stress test our loan portfolio from time to time, but generally speaking, as the economy slows, there will be less loan demand. But I think the other thing that we need to also consider, interest rates on deposits are actually rising very, very rapidly. So when you see both of those things occurring at the same time, it will slow up uh, banks uh, from providing access to capital because they're paying so much for the deposit and there's only so much they can make on the loan that they have to really make a, a very good credit decision to make sure that that loan does not come back to haunt them. So do you see a difference between what you just described in this cycle versus past cycles with interest rates rising and slowdowns? You know, when, when the interest rates were a lot lower, it was a lot easier to actually um, approve the credit. When they're higher, you actually have to stress test the borrower to see can he make the payments in the event rates continue to rise, especially if the, if the small business loan is tied to prime. Peter, thoughts? Well, and, and I think all of this is very intentional. From a monetary policy at the Federal Reserve, they wanted to see a tightening of the economy. They uh, want to bring inflation down. And so what we're seeing happening in the banking industry, it's not that banks are changing their lending practices or policies. It's that interest rates are increasing some new deals don't cash flow and existing borrowers are kind of tightening their belts and watching for the future. So all of this is very intentional from the Fed's perspective. But Fred, Fred, from your from your colleagues and your, your association members, do you see a concern around the commercial real estate asset and the lending on that? You know, I would have thought that we would have seen that long before now and in continuing to to, to to talk to our bankers, they still haven't seen any, you know, any significant risk bubbling up out of that. Kind of, I will tag on a little bit to what uh, Peter and Jim said, the rate of, the rate and the magnitude of the Fed increases created, a, the, it will create, I do think, a slowdown in the economy. And that's what we're talking about. It, it I think it, I think it was an all time, historic rate and magnitude of Fed increases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say that if there is an Achilles heel here, uh, it would be in commercial real estate lending. If you look at what's happening to pricing of commercial mortgage-backed securities, for instance, uh, they are trading at pretty steep discounts relative to say, you know, triple B corporate bonds, um, and you know the margin above treasuries is very, very high. Uh, so that suggests that at least the markets are very concerned about that segment. So to the extent that certain banks potentially have exposure or other institutional investors, which may not be banks, um, exposure to that particular sector, I think that's one area to keep an eye on. So Bob, in just about 30 seconds here for you, is that the is that the securitization securitization of the corporate bond? Uh, that's that's correct. That okay. Yes, that's the securitized instrument that comprised of a portfolio of of, uh, of commercial uh, mortgages, and so that trade out in the marketplace. So we've got a couple minutes left, and I, I do want to at least float the idea of shadow banking. Uh, is, is so for anyone, Jim? Let me start with you. Does shadow banking again come back 
into the dialogue. And, and for the benefit of viewers, shadow banking would be PayPal, Venmo, lenders that aren't regulated. Is there going to be more scrutiny and more discussion about, well, maybe we need to bring them back, maybe we need to bring them into the fold about having some oversight? You know, I think the last thing we need is more oversight of community and regional banks and even large banks. But specifically to your question, yes, they will be even more uh, regulated and reviewed than they are today because of this entire, I don't want to call it a crisis, but this entire episode. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do see that happening more. I think the one thing that we haven't really touched on is I think we all have to remember SVB had 93% of their deposits were uninsured. That's a very risky business model. That's very unusual for any bank in the United States to have a percentage that high. Fred, Peter, same, same question. Do you, do you expect that there would be more scrutiny now, not, not on the banking system, but maybe the shadow banking system? Is that going to be part of the dialogue? And we've got about a minute. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, 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 Peter, I'll jump in first. Uh, uh, I do, and if you if you go back to what I said earlier about the unique business model of SVB and Signature, yeah. high concentrations of of deposits from a relatively small base, that's similar to what you have in the uh, the uh, shadow banking world, and their funding probably isn't as robust and as diversified as what you see in a community bank. Peter, last twenty seconds. Well, and, and all we ever seek, and bank, bankers are not afraid of competition, and we've been asking for years uh, a level playing field. If you're in financial services, you need the oversight that uh, banks of all kinds have. And it, what's interesting about the, the silver lining, I guess, of this episode is we've not talked about FDIC yeah. insurance for years. Customers didn't seem to care. Right. They do now, okay. and they're seeing the value that the banking industry brings because of that confidence they can have. Peter, last word, and it's a good one to end on. Gentlemen, thank you. Have a good weekend. Until next week, good night.